you would set this up in <laughs> rapid fire speeds uh, in half an hour. And to the FOFA gallery, our roundtable participants, and those of you joining us tonight, both in the room and via the live stream link. It is, it's an honor and a privilege to participate as a moderator in this evening's very important discussion. I would like to begin by saying a few words about this conversation, this event, and this space that we are gathered in tonight. The first thing to mention is respect. I would ask that we all maintain a respectful level of communication and that we actively listen to each other. Respect and understanding grow when we listen from a place of openness. We are here to move this debate forward toward understanding and care not entrench supposed sides into further intractability. The second point is that we must be cognizant of our own voices, privilege, and power, and especially be self-aware of these things in relation to one another. With this in mind, myself, the organizers, and the roundtable participants are hopeful that this discussion will take place in a safe space, where dialogue and discussion is inclusive, productive, respectful, and mindful. The last thing is context. Tonight's event has been organized in response to the ongoing debate and discussion around Dominic Gagnon's Of the North film, which screened at RDM last November. People engaged in this discussion are justifiably passionate about the film and its circulation, but the discourse is about much more than one film. As the National Indigenous Media Arts Coalition recently put in their letter, Censorship and expression do not happen in a vacuum. And as such, I hope that we can all keep in mind the context in which this discussion is taking place. Exclusion or denigration that First, First Nations make an, an Inuit considerable against every day. With, with all that in mind, I have no questions or provocations I compiled and edited based on input from tonight's roundtable participants. And to begin, I think it is only right to hear first from Inuit on our panel. And while this is a bigger discussion than one film, certainly, um, since there is a film at the center of it, I'd like to start there, and so would our participants. So we're going to start with Alethea. Um, so we're going to start with Alethea, and then we're just going to move from stage left 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 I'm going to read, 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 read. So, for everyone who has some such, I'm going to read. We're going to put them in the okay? <clears throat> we cannot even begin to discuss the artistic and cultural merits of this film without first acknowledging that it's immoral to make or show a film that contains graphic shots of a woman's naked body and her vagina without her consent. Period. Whether this woman is Inuit or not, a celebrity, an ex-girlfriend, a porn star, or a nun, you cannot do this without her consent. It's not okay. And that's what Danielle has done. Sharing it with one source does not mean you can share it with any source in any context. Consent is not transferable. Despite Amy pointing out that the two of the shots of naked women in this film, it seems that many people want to gloss over this moral boundary and discuss the artistic merits of the film. They prefer to talk about art, culture, and whether or not the, the choice to screen the film is an act of discrimination. 
I wonder if the people of Quebec would be as flippant about a woman's privacy if the women in the film were not needed. Maybe yes, maybe no, I truly don't know. Does this moral lapse point to an unconscious racism? Or does it point to the incredible apathy we've developed worldwide about privacy rights? Or is it a bit of both? I do think there's an interest in line of discussion. But I don't for a second think that this means in the film has done something positive. The film has not raised the quality of discussion on this issue in the province of the country. While we may have pockets like this of intellectual discussion in circles of highbrow art, for the most part, what Gagnon has done is further entrench the attitude that it's okay to think of Inuit as drunks, as Inuit women as sexual objects, and everyone's privacy as less important than anything. Showing this film, making this film, and showing this film is a violation. And I thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity to discuss this without the violation of having to watch it. of what the content was because although I appreciate that this may be a new conversation for some of you it is not new for Inuit these are the stereotypes and the painful imagery and the the, um, the misinformation that circulates about Inuit people and indigenous people that does have a palatable effect on our life something that I'm very difficult. And 
uh, them seeing descriptions of the film saying that this is an anthropological or you know, this is an anthropological piece, uh, saying that this is part of hearing people saying that this is a reality, um, knowing that my family, my, my friends are not like this, and not myself. And then, uh, you know, hearing uh, also this is documentary, and I, and I started looking into the credits and seeing the, the source footage that there was a lot of fictional elements in this film that were not coming from the not um, And then seeing the narrative change here in Montreal, but not seeing the narrative change elsewhere, because the same old description used and previous film festivals before this controversy started was still being used. Is being used right now and not to be able to I say that this is a kind of um, So I, I, I feel uh, very frustrated, I guess, that you know, the story or the narrative about this film is changing, but you know, without people, without the Inuit and other people requesting to have the film removed, the, this film wouldn't have changed itself. D'abord, je voudrais peut-être présenter un peu la raison pour laquelle je suis ici. À la base, je devais, après ce que les humains qui étaient venus, j'avais pensé me rétracter de cette table ronde. J'ai choisi de me présenter parce que ma position ici n'est pas d'un côté ou de l'autre. Je m'intéresse plutôt à voir s'il y a des possibilités de nouvelles formes d'attachement à cette problématique-là, à voir comment, comme une société, on peut créer des... Euh, l'occasion de formuler un diagnostic performatif de nos modes d'organisation politique. Donc je ne m'intéresse pas à faire, je m'intéresse pas peut-être à faire justice sans faire procès, parce qu'on m'avait dit clairement que ma participation ici ne serait pas du tout sur un procès, un procès d'intention ou euh, à choisir un clan. Donc euh, je veux euh, mettre ça clair de mon côté. Euh, sinon, moi je suis allée dans le Nord, j'ai une, une, une relation très personnelle avec des gens là-bas, donc euh, ces questions-là sont très viscérales pour moi aussi. Euh, c'est très euh, délicat pour moi d'adresser ici aujourd'hui. Ce que j'ai essayé de faire, c'est d'aller lire des textes de d'autres gens qui ont publié pour essayer non pas de, de rendre un mérite de cette critique, mais peut-être de questionner l'intention de cette critique. Euh, je comprends que certains gens ne sont peut-être pas intéressés à la questionner, mais j'aimerais peut-être ça euh, ouvrir la possibilité. Euh, donc je me questionne s'il si est possible de questionner les intentions d'artistes tout en respect, tout en résistant la polarisation. Nous sommes ouverts à explorer, à questionner les intentions de l'artiste. On peut lui reprocher toutes les maladresses du monde, mais qu'en est-il de ses intentions Donc, je ne voudrais pas m'attarder trop longtemps à relire, j'avais sorti plein de points. Une chose, je ne voudrais peut-être pas répondre à certaines de vos plus tard. Euh, J'aimerais prendre peut-être l'exemple d'une euh, image qui est présente, euh, qui va peut-être euh, me permettre d'évoquer une réalité euh, qui permet peut-être une autre ligne de fuite. Donc, euh, quand Dominique parle de son film, euh, il dit que peut-être à quelque part c'est né d'un désir ou d'une certaine ambiguïté par rapport au plan Nord, par rapport à la grève étudiante, euh, le rapport de la, euh, la, euh, que les glaces font, des machines qui montent, l'augmentation de la circulation et certainement l'augmentation des circulations qui génère de euh, plus grandes inégalités. Donc peut-être si on voit euh, par exemple l'image de la plateforme de forage. Euh, il serait, je pense que filmer une plateforme de forage est quelque chose qui est un droit euh, qui est interdit. Donc, euh, présenter cette image-là sur euh, un écran géant devient peut-être, dans une salle de cinéma, devient peut-être une, euh, une forme de solidarité avec une résistance à rendre cette réalité-là visible. Donc, euh, je me demande si on peut transmettre, et ici je, je vais citer euh, André Habib, euh, transmettre la force de résistance de certaines de ces images, c'est-à-dire le fait qu'elles génèrent. Donc, euh, comme il dit, euh, l'exploitation industrielle irresponsable et insensée du territoire, elle est dans l'indifférence concise, constante et concertée des gouvernements et une proportion terrifiante des citoyens envers cette réalité depuis des décennies, alors que les problèmes sont connus, criants, et elle est dans la brutalité des conditions de vie de ces populations tenues en situation d'apartheid économique, juridique et politique. Donc, euh, une autre chose que je voudrais faire, donc euh, en questionnant les intentions de l'artiste, je me demande si euh, c'est possible de, de reprendre son propre argument à dire que le médium de sa pratique est la salle de cinéma et non pas YouTube nécessairement, qu'on a affaire à une, 
une, une perspective peut-être d'intermédiaire, si on veut l'appeler comme ça. Donc, euh, est-ce que ce serait possible de penser que, bon, je ne vais pas me positionner pour ou contre la censure, c'est pas ici, je ne veux pas rentrer par la censure sur mon point. Est-ce qu'on peut montrer pour discuter Est-ce que montrer est nécessairement euh, une pratique autoritaire qui euh, donne une forme, euh, un pouvoir de représentation absolue euh, à la personne qui choisit de montrer ces images-là Donc je ne veux pas faire ça comme un point. Pour moi, ce sont des questions. Euh, je me demande si c'est possible euh, euh, de voir ça un peu comme un miroir, par exemple, ou moi... Euh, je suis confrontée à plein de stéréotypes. Est-ce que ce film-là peut me permettre de me questionner pourquoi je vis avec ces stéréotypes-là euh, Ils émergent d'où et comment je fais pour les euh, résister à ça Voilà. J'ai vu la première fois Of the North euh, au RIDM et depuis ce temps, c'est un film qui euh, empoisonne ma vie. Euh, jamais un film euh, ne m'a autant troublé, questionné et fait remettre en question mes propres, euh, mes propres visions de, de la culture euh, et de l'art. Euh, ça fait maintenant presque cinq mois que les RIDM ont eu lieu. Je suis très content que cette discussion-là ait enfin lieu. Je crois qu'elle était nécessaire euh, pour tenter de, de calmer les esprits, parce qu'à travers la colère, souvent, on a la difficulté à s'entendre. Et donc, je remercie les gens d'avoir organisé cette table ronde. Et c'est pour ça que je suis là aujourd'hui, même si pour moi, ce n'est pas une situation très, très confortable. Mm. Euh, d'être assis à l'extrême droite de cette table, <rire> puisque normalement, je me faisais plutôt à l'extrême gauche. Euh, cela dit, euh, je, je pense que le film pose des questions, en tout cas, ou a suscité des questions fondamentales. Euh, quand je l'ai vu, je l'ai vu, c'est certain, avec mes lunettes de mâle blanc qui n'a pas vécu euh, le racisme comme... Euh, les gens provenant des communautés inuit et autochtones. Suite, à, suite aux controverses suite à, qui ont suivi le film, euh, ça m'a amené beaucoup à me questionner, à me remettre en question. Je remercie Steven, entre autres, pour ton travail que tu as fait euh, de journaliste. Euh, C'est des choses auxquelles je, je n'avais pas pensé, que je n'avais pas perçu dans le film. Ça m'a fait euh, remettre en question ma propre vision du film. Et je suis encore un peu... Euh, je ne sais pas trop où me situer. Euh, je n'ai pas envie de porter un jugement éthique, mais j'ai envie de poser les questions et peut-être euh, d'être capable de vous prêter mes lunettes deux secondes pour voir dans quelle mesure moi j'ai pu percevoir ce film-là euh, au moment où je l'ai vu et au travers des prochaines questions. C'est ce que j'espère pouvoir faire. Um, so, we, if, if anyone wants to respond to anything that's been said in these rounds, we can do that, or we can just move to the first question. Yeah? First question? Okay. So, I asked all the participants to send me 200-word question or provocation, and they all sent me giant essays. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then I, I've whittled them down into... Um, what they were supposed to be in terms of length. Um, and so there's, there's de definitely some editorializing going on here and, and, and me just trying to make sense of, of these things. So interpret them as you, as you, as you feel fit. Uh, the first one is about reception, and then the second one is about censorship. So the first one is, can an artistic work trigger opposing interpretations based on the subjectivities of the audience? And shouldn't we also consider the subjectivity of the artist or filmmaker? Put differently, aren't there many ways to read a film? And based on the diversity of reception from maker to film subjects to audiences, can there be a correct and incorrect interpretation? So who would like to go first? Heather? Uh. Wow. 
I oh. guess it's me. <laughs> okay, so, so Heather, then, then Matthew? Uh, I, I think that uh, maybe I can draw a parallel context with the museum world. Um, what was almost 25 years ago now, we had a couple of controversies uh, with exhibitions such as The Spirit Sings, which uh, presented indigenous art in a very uh, historical context without uh, discussing at all living indigenous peoples, presenting them in kind of an authentic past. Uh, also at the ROM, there was the exhibition Into the Heart of Africa, which presented uh, racism through the lens of uh, how uh, sort of a by white people, for white people kind of a discourse in both cases, ignoring the voices of the people involved. And these two events sparked a really critical conversation across uh, museum people, curators, artists, and uh, arts practitioners on what uh, what the ethics of exhibition histories and uh, presentation should be. And out of that conversation very clearly came uh, what has become a bit of a mantra in the art historical world, and that is nothing about us without us. How can we have a, uh, a how can there be a work of art, um, a film that says something meaningful about a group of people without ever having learned anything about them? That is, you know, um, the film is purported to be this interesting, like, outsider looking in, view on this history, but what has resulted, as you can see from the film, is just a rehashing of many old stereotypes. The, uh, the film was purported to have a balance between um, sort of good representations of Inuit and bad representations of Inuit, but having watched the film, I could tell you right now, the good setups in my eyes were all setups, or the good images were all setups for the bad ones. For example, there is a cut with a bunch of really cute kids uh, doing flips outdoors on a mattress. They seem to be having fun, they're doing some acrobatics, and it cuts to a drunk teenager. There is clearly a correlation between what's happening there. There's another scene where two drunk adults are fighting and talking, and then it cuts to a kid sitting on the floor by himself. You know, there's a narrative that's being created in the film this way, and so for me, it was very clear that uh, the issue is, of course, is the, the idea that it's possible to uh, talk about indigenous peoples in a way that does not reinforce and reinscribe those negative stereotypes. Um, if you don't know the real people, how can you unpack what you're bringing to it? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We don't Glad need to applaud after every comment. <laughs> <laughs> I just say that now. We got two hours. Like, <laughs> clock is ticking. <laughs> Good. That's you. <laughs> well, I have three ideas. I'll try to be succinct. So, first of all, alluding to Heather, when she was said that you had to know your topic, literally, before exploiting it, I often heard many documentarists uh, say, the least I know, the better it is. So, a film is a work of art not necessarily a special report or a television show, and it, you, you don't have to have the same rigor. It's not necessarily journalistic or scientific, and that's why it can easily be, and it must be, critiqued and reviewed. Uh, and we talked about reception of the work and censorship. Well, Dominique Gagnon's work, and I've been following him for years, revolves around censorship. This is someone who has worked making films from YouTube videos which were censored by YouTube. So here you have a situation where a movie maker makes films from censored videos and he becomes censored. So now these films are not as such, are not perceived with modernistic cinema glasses. I think that a work of art is, the, the work of art is in its social reception, rather, and not in the work itself. And I think it has to do with performance in a way, the art of performance. And I would talk about one sequence in the film that has uh, shocked some of my colleagues here in the panel or other people in the room to show you how I think it's easy to interpret the film in two different ways. So in the film, there's a sequence with two Inuk who are going to pour uh, dirty water in nature, warm waters, and the caribou go and drink from that water. So if I put myself in someone else's shoes who see these images, you say, oh, that's horrible. You're showing us, us as being people who do not respect nature. 
So this would reinforce a stereotype. This shows that we're savages. When I saw that image, I told myself, well, what a shithole in these communities they don't even have an aqueduct system. They don't even have sewers. So they have to use the, you know, to pour their used waters. And I know nothing about what's happening up there. I never went there. And I'm so aware of my ignorance and its limits. But I saw that with my glasses. So that was my interpretation. So I didn't go like, oh my God, those savages, and why do they do that? And that's horrible. No, that's what I wanted to say. So, I'm just wondering... Pardon, I'm going to speak in French, I'm going to speak in English, certain. So, I'm wondering if... I'm wondering about scale. I have difficulty considering this as an ethnographic uh, work. For me, it's an archaeological work, like excavations. So, there are many different levels of scale. So I'm wondering, the fact that you show something real that is filmed by someone else, can that aspire to a representation that is legitimate? If you use someone's reality, then are you giving it real realism, or does it, do you turn it into a fiction? I, I hope I understand the question correctly, and it's not lost in translation, but um, I really question the widespread, um, how easily and widespread it's been accepted that this film is of reality. <laughs> um, I mean, Stefan's done a, a huge amount of research showing that many of these clips are not even of the North. And that there are people, you know, the the clips of men fighting on the floor and drunk, they're not Inuit. So yes, those are actual people. It's not it's uh, not a fiction clip. It wasn't acted, but it's presented and portrayed as if it's Inuit. And you know damn well that Gagnon knew the audience would assume that these people are Inuit. And if you pretend that that's not true. I, I question your sanity. Stefan? Um, I, I, I don't think we can look at this as an archaeological work, because even in archaeology, there's ethics involved. Um, when you go to sites, you, know, you, you, you deal with the community who are still living who, when you're digging up their ancestors' bones. Um, and that reminds me as well of, and this has been happening in, in, the, in, in Inuit history, where Inuit have been displayed in human zoos. Uh, there was a book called uh, Bring Me Back, Give Me Back My Father's Bones, where in around the 1900, uh, six Inuit were taken from Greenland to New York at a museum. Four of them died. One was a father, and his son survived. And the son was adopted by the general manager of the museum. They had a burial uh, a ceremony for his father. And it was years later when the boy was, when he grew up, he was walking through the museum that his adopted father managed. He saw his birth father's bones on display. Um, so I think even in archaeology, there is ethics involved. And there's ethical procedures. Uh, there's peer review. And I don't think that any of these ethical procedures were followed in making this film or in uh, a lot of the screenings of this film where you know, the owners of this film, the, the people seen in this film should have been involved and should have given permission uh, in order for this film to have seen the light of day. Okay. <laughs> And I'd just also add that I just realized that this is my microphone, and I don't need to share with Alicia. I was like, right, Mais, I have my own. Je voudrais juste continuer sur ce que tu dis. Well, Stephen, I'd like to continue on that. I agree with you that, yes, there are, well, I imagine, I, I'm not speaking for Dominique Gagnon at all. I imagine that there are images there 
where he did not get uh, the, the people's consent. However, I do know that there are other images where he actually was in a relationship with the people who filmed these images and asked him to withdraw these images. They recontacted him and Dominique said, well, this is many months ago, almost many years, because he was working on it for years, two years at least, and all of a sudden, well, with the debate, it seems that uh, people saw the film, and now, well, with the debate, people started saying it was such a racist film, so they decided, they asked him to withdraw the images. Now, I don't think he has done it for all images, for some of them. I think he did for some of them, maybe the most, uh, the easiest ones, actually. But I don't know. And he had an ethical intent. Now, was it pushed uh, till the end? And was it well done? I do not know. I tried before today to find a space for dialogue where you could discuss with Dominique and actually confront him on all of these issues, like, you know, using these images that do not come from the North. And I would even take it further because he removed the origin of some of these images, such as uh, that bear in the zoo from Berlin. The movie was called Bear in Zoo in Berlin, and he removed Berlin. So there's a, an intent here to, to sort of let people think that these are all images of the North. Like Alethea said, the two guys, like, you know, fighting on the floor, well, we think they're Inuit, and finally they're Texans. So I would have liked to ask him all of this and confront him and get an answer. Now, unfortunately, well, it was very difficult. It was impossible, actually. So I think that in all good faith, the Rendezvous du Cinéma Québécois tried to create a space for discussion, which will be a space dominated by white people, of course. And outside of that institution with a cine club about a month ago, we presented the film and Alethea asked about translation, and then, well, you were contacted. We really wanted to make sure you would be there. We really wanted this con discussion, and we wanted a confrontation in a, re a respectful way, and that was not possible. So th there was a type of, um, we had a, a climate where the discussion was very arduous and almost impossible. So I don't have any answers, and I wish I did. Let's, uh, oh, that's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's try to, um, the details are important, uh, but um, a lot of people won't, uh, won't get all the references. Um, uh, so let's also try to talk about the broader issues, I think. Mm -hmm. And, we, we and can probably keep grounded. post some of the uh, the evidentiary kind of work online afterwards, mm -hmm. right, Jennifer, and yeah. other stuff. Can I ask a question? I can pose a question rapidly with him. I don't want to talk about cultural representation of the Inuit. That's not my place. But I'm wondering, is like you know thinking about the documentary as a form of aesthetics, then would we say that the documentary is an information campaign or a journalistic work that aspires to a certain ideal whose validity as an artwork would be cautioned by a proof or evidence procedure? The, so is the social marketing, that's what I mean, so I'm wondering about that. I'm talking about the practice as an artistic form. I understand what we're saying, and I respect that, but I'm wondering, will this become a category of analysis that would apply to all documentaries, or can we keep a certain form of plasticity or porosity? Cancel a later question that's about aesthetics and ethics, so. I'll start, then you go. I was yeah. going to say uh, just that I think that there is uh, director's bias in all filmmaking. I think we can agree that that is a thing. I don't need these. Uh, <laughs> and then there is, and then there is um, directorial. Um, 
what's the word for it? Then there is, you know, an antagonistic work. There is something that is deceptive in this filmmaking. Uh, I think that there are, you know, that, that obviously documentary filmmaking is a creative practice as well as another form of practice, but it does uh, speak to certain truths. And in this particular situation, I know you don't want to talk about the Inuit thing, but it's hard to just sort of speak around all documentaries. We're not, um, we're not here to say that all, all documentaries need to go through uh, a, you know, a rigorous process that is vetted by, <laughs> you know, indigenous people. <laughs> but when, these, but when the subject matter is indigenous people and when the films are being created with public funding, I think there is a very legitimate question there that uh, starts with the arts funders and moves through who their juries are and who the makeup of their organizations are and then travels down through um, film screening and who, who is organizing these and who is deciding and vetting what is happening there, because I think that it's not just the artist who has a responsibility to behave ethically. You know, it's not a legal responsibility, but I think it is a, a moral responsibility. But it is also, uh, it's, uh, it is the responsibility of art juries, of organizations, of screeners, and anyone else who is going to look at this content to think, you know, is this, is this just a, someone's uh, subjective positioning, or is there something else at play here that is, um, negatively impacting and representing people in a stereotypical and racist manner. Yeah, I agree. I think when it's, you know, you, you don't have to go through so many ethical reviews for documentaries or for film, but when a film is being described or it's being advertised as uh, a documentary. Uh, or an that ethnography. Uh, ethnography, like a documentary already suggests that this is a reflection of reality. It's a mirror, as some people have called it. Um, and also that it's, yeah, it's a reality, um, or ethnography as well. Um, then I think when you start to include those scientific words, you know, and, and also, I mean, this, this film was funded by a research grant. It wasn't, it wasn't an art grant. It was a research grant by the Quebec Council of Arts. Um, so when it, in, in that context, I think it, it should go through ethical review or it should go through some type of review like that. And so it's, it's, I don't think it's just the film here that was problematic. I think it was also the funders. Um, I think uh, this film has, is an example, I guess, that's shown maybe the Quebec Arts Council that it's really missing uh, some ethics uh, in their ethical protocols. Um, and as well as uh, a lot of the film festivals, because I've, I've mentioned it with, uh, with a number of other people, organizations that have screened the film, that uh, you know, I ask them, like, well, do you consider yourself a cultural institution? They say yes. And I say, well, other cultural institutions have debated about this subject of representation of minorities or cultural minor representation for decades. Uh, museums have uh, generally agreed on and created a policy around cultural representation. And it's, it's an international code of ethics, actually. And um, I've shared that code of ethics with a number of film screeners. And I, said, I suggested, you know, maybe look at Article 6.5 and 6.7 about representation in communities. Uh, maybe, you, you know, film organizations could look at maybe adapting that to the, you know, their own film communities. Um, and that's basically saying if, if, if you've got a piece that is owned by another culture, another community, you involve that culture, you communicate with them, their interests uh, are paramount. You can't show uh, something that they don't want to be shown. Um, and, I, and I think that's a reflective, uh, reflection of museums where, for example, here in Canada, uh, false face masks, condolence canes, uh, turtle rattles in many of the First Nations cultures are not meant to be seen by the public because that's how they hold power to heal people is, you know, that, that they're only seen uh, by the, the people involved in these ceremonies. So I, I, think, I think what we're dealing with here is different communities and different cultures that have different value systems. And I think organizations need to respect that just as a lot of other cultures respect the dominant culture here. Alethea? Yeah. No <laughs> clapping. Um, first of all, my friends here are very, very smart, and I'm always impressed by them. I didn't know it was a research grant. That's very interesting. Um, 
And while I agree with absolutely everything they just said, I'm, I'd also like to present another point of view, and that is, you know, I do agree that the vast majority um, of films about indigenous people should involve indigenous people. Um, however, I also, I also think it is entirely possible um, for non-natives to make very interesting, very powerful and valuable films about indigenous peoples. Um, Maria Lynn right here being an excellent example of that. She just won a Canadian Screen Award for her documentary, Saul which she co-directed with Susan Avignac and Inuk Elder and Iglulik. Um, so there are great examples of how non-Indigenous people can work with Indigenous people. But I also, I also don't necessarily think it's impossible to make a film about Indigenous people without their involvement and not screw up so badly. <laughs> I actually think it's a very, you know, if you for a minute pretend that um, he didn't violate the privacy of uh, vulnerable people, um, if you pretend for a moment that he didn't lie about the sources of uh, some of the clips, um, and if you pr pretend for a moment that he wasn't extremely revisionist um, about the history of the film and why he made it, um, after he started being criti criticized about it. If you ignore all of that and many other things, and just for a moment think about the, the concept of making a film about a people you've never met, um, and experiencing them through videos that they post online, I think that's a really interesting way to analyze a culture, and I, I don't see anything wrong with that concept, and I think it's actually a very interesting idea for making a film. Um, I do think he blundered about and did it very, very poorly and irresponsibly um, with a population that is extremely vulnerable. Uh, so I think it was very irresponsibly done. But the, the concept itself, the, the um, artistic um, concept is very interesting to me. Okay. Um, so yes, we could spend six hours um, covering the mannequin debate of ethics and aesthetics, but I'm gonna move us into um, censorship because censorship has really been at the center of the conversations that have been happening outside of this room up until now. So my question for you all is, um, who decides what is fair and just cultural representation and if the community or culture represented disagrees and calls for the end of circulation of a work, is this a form of censorship? Considering the erasure and near invisibility of indigenous filmmakers at most film festivals, can we say the rejection of their work by non-indigenous curators is also a form of censorship? Shouldn't we consider the historical and contemporary contexts of power dynamics around the circulation of some artworks and films and the refusal or rejection of others in this larger conversation about censorship. Who wants to? <laughs> Stefan, you had lots of good comments about censorship. Yeah, I forget them all. <laughs> no. uh, I want to go back to something actually you said not to before about how um, some people who have made videos were in contact or worked with Gagnon in making this film. Um, I actually made an Excel sheet uh, from the credits and found most of the videos on YouTube that was used in making this film. And I contacted as many people as I, as I could to see, to inform them and, and ask them, do you know, were you knowledgeable that this video is used in this film? Um, of the replies that I got, because I didn't get replies from everybody, of the replies that I got, every single one of them said that they were not knowledgeable that their videos were used in this film and that they don't give permission um, to have the, the videos used in this film. So um, as far as I know, uh, the ones who I've spoken with, well, I've communicated with, uh, said that they were not knowledgeable, they didn't work, uh, they didn't collaborate in the production of this film. There could be others that I, that I, I couldn't get a hold of or that I didn't communicate with um, who were in collaboration and didn't work with, but as far as I can tell, um, from the people that have contacted me, who have subsequently, like they have then contacted the distributor in Gagnon, 
and requested a total of about 40 videos to be removed. Um, as far as I can tell, I, I don't know anyone who uh, were knowledgeable about this. I'd like to come back to what you were saying, that Dominique uh, had a research grant from uh, Quebec Council. The expression research grant, you shouldn't really uh, look only at that. That's the only thing you can tick off when you ask for a grant in order to get money to be able to make an, a work of art. So research is not scientific research here in this instance. It's just producing the film. It's the process. And also, I would like to ask again, in as much as you want consent from the community, from the person interviewed, here as an example, and also, oh, I'd like to know this type of ethics now. Should it be limited only to Inuit or Native communities, or should it be also for all women, homosexuals? So, and necessarily, if I make a, a film on someone, and finally, it shows this person in a position maybe that's difficult for that person, then would that person be entitled to refusing my showing my film and distributing my, friends, my film? So, you know, who's got the final authority to say, yes, this film's okay or this film's not okay? And who represents the community? So, because here we're all an elite, let's put it that way. So who would say, okay, this is okay, this is not okay? And that's another debate. Besides copyright issues, which is very legitimate. But beyond that, I'm wondering, like, who really can decide? Yes, and I would uh, like to ask, of those who signed, um, who has seen the movie, the film? So how do you decide whether you sign if you have not seen the film? This NEMAC letter, who has seen the movie? No, I know, but I'm wondering, I'm wondering about how do you make a decision like that for a censorship and if you don't even know what material is censored. I'm just questioning myself. I'm just wondering about the protocol. Letter, and I've seen the film, and I know a number of the people who signed it saw the film. I don't know if everyone did, um, but I think some people, even if they hadn't seen it, trust the opinions of the people who are in the film and have seen it, and said that they didn't give permission um, to use their music or image or vagina in the film. Um, so uh, I, you know, if if I hear people who have very legitimate complaints like that, I, I will stand in sol solidarity with, solidarity with them, and I don't see anything wrong with that. I, you know, I've I have to admit though, I've also wondered um, in the other direction. There's apparently a film critic that wrote an article in support of the film and defending it without ever having seen it. So it's definitely gone um, both ways. I, and I, I want to add that uh, this film in particular has not been censored by the Inuit community. As <laughs> Alethea has said, we don't have the power to censor films. The only power we have is the power of social media, the power of protest, and the power of awareness. And that's what happened is we started a social media campaign, and the result was uh, changing the minds of people or uh, getting on deciding to pull the, the film from this festival. But the film has been shown already many times. And it's only through the fact that people are realizing that they're in the film and they're requesting that they be removed. And Gangnam is doing that to his credit. Uh, that he, he, in he some has cases. mostly done it. <laughs> mostly He's also doing it. said he would and then not done it. So. so, you know, in that situation, I want to be really clear that we have not censored anything. We are not, uh, we are not bodies. We are not uh, boards. We are not organizations. We are individuals who 
uh, decided to protest what we saw, you know? So if it is one thing to make a work of art, it, we are completely within our right to protest what we believe to be um, racist representations that circulate in contexts that are much broader than we can possibly reach outside of this. You know, it wasn't that long ago that we didn't have social media and we didn't have platforms to do this. 90, for, 90 plus percent of all Inuit communities are in fly-in, boat-in only communities. They don't mostly live in the South until very recently, and it's been very hard over the last you know, several decades to actually gain this kind of recognition and to mobilize in this way. For a very long time, Inuit were considered to just be savages who killed baby seals in the North. Like That was the main message that circulated around Inuit people in the South throughout the like, 60s, 70s, 80s. And so it's just now that with the advent of technologies that we are able to have a voice on these platforms. And so of course we're gonna use it. I don't think that's censorship. I think when it I think when it comes to con cons uh, consulting different communities, um, there's no like simple answer to that. There's no like black or white uh, solution for that because every community is different. Every culture is different. First Nations communities are very different from Inuit communities. They have leaders that you can go to and they, they that they can help make decisions. Inuit uh, culture is traditionally independent egalitarianism, where many Inuit don't even like the word leader. But if you engage with Inuit in the community and you ask them, like, well, hey, do you know, like, like do you, like, would you approve of this film or would you approve of this work? Some might say, I'm not in the right place to, to, to do that. I'm not in the right place to approve of something like that. But they probably know someone who does. They know someone who probably would, that they would put their trust in um, and say, like, I trust this person's, you know, this individual's um, judgment. judgment, basically, yeah. So I would put my trust into them, and they could be the ones that could decide. You know. So I, I, think it's, I think it really depends on, you know, the different cultures, the different communities, um, when it comes to this type of consultation. But I think at, at the very least, you have to consult with them. Um, they have to be involved in some way. I, oh, someone else? Okay. Um, I, have a, I, I have another question that's very, uh, another one that's circulating a lot um, in the discourse, and that's about uh, the film being a generative positive force in that, um, you know, people, you hear people say this a lot, which is uh, don't controversial films like Gagnon's positively contribute to culture and society by inspiring debate and discussion, including the very one we're having tonight. So I'd like to pose this question and maybe start at this end of the table. <laughs> yeah. <ugh. laughs> um, this is great because we have, what, a couple of hours to, to speak to people. And um, and I've met with, with some people, some festival programmers that chose to screen the film and talked for a couple of hours and by the end of it I felt like I was starting to you know maybe get through to them a little bit or at least have them see my perspective a bit it takes two hours um, the vast majority of the country um, or the province or people who've seen the film are not going to give Inuit two hours to tell them what's wrong with this film they're going to all they're going to have time to hear us say is you know what, we're not all drunks, <laughs> we're not all sexual objects. Um, and uh, our issues of addiction and poverty in the North are not because of oil rigs in Russia. Um, it's not uh, capitalism. It was very deliberate and forceful and conscious acts by Southern Canadians to do things like shoot all of our sled dogs, take away all of our children, force people into school, take away their language. Um, it was very active uh, colonialism that the people of southern Canada were very conscious of. And to just blame it on big, bad, faceless corporations w gives people the opportunity to wash their hands of that responsibility. Um, so I just completely reject that idea, that, that it's generated um, quality discussion because we don't get the chance for people to hear that. All we get th the chance for people to hear is we're not all drunks, really. I, I think it's. I mean, I think it's. It's helped. 
has like uh, given us a platform here to actually have a positive discussion or have something positive come out of it. But I think that's because we're here. Like this is Montreal has I think about the third or fourth largest enemy population in southern Canada. Okay. Yet at the same time, a recent study from 2011 showed that Montrealers are the least knowledgeable about Indigenous people compared to 11 other major cities in Canada. Um, so I, I think I think it does this film has provoked a, a, you know and right now I think this is evidence that this has provoked a productive conversation. But what about Italy, uh, where it's going to be screened next month? Mm -hmm. What about New York? What about Mexico City? What about Switzerland? What about Germany? What about the UK? Um, Inuit have not been in invited to any of these screenings. And in fact, the Museum of the Moving Image uh, refused to speak with Inuit uh, before, the screen before their screening in, in New York in January. So I, I think it, it has provoked, I think, a positive conversation. But at the same time, it, it provoked a conversation in a way that, like, us here, we've had to mobilize. And it didn't provoke us, and, and it didn't really motivate us or inspire us positively to come out and speak, you know. It basically, we were offended, we were hurt, and we had to say something. And at the same time, I produce a radio show where we do talk about a lot of these issues. This is broadcast every second Tuesday. <laughs> but also, I work on a research project where a week after the film screening was on RIDM, we had uh, our own film screening in Viewport, where we had Inuit-made short films made in Montreal. And they all were asked the question, basically, what's it like to be an Inuk in Montreal? And some were positive. Some showed struggles. Some, some people talked about addictions. So. You know, I heard some of the arguments that from people say, like, you know, well, like this, this is showing the gritty reality, or this is showing one side. You know, it can't always be sunshine and rainbows and stuff that you know everyone else wants to see. For us Inuit, no, like we, a lot of the stuff that we show, or a lot of stuff, stories we talk about, and a lot of the reality we show is actually a lot of the struggles that a lot of Inuit go through. I just add before I, I just want to jump in with one addendum, and that is that uh, last night I thought it would be a good idea further to this point to uh, put together a, a takeaway for all of you, which I have and that we'll also post online, which is one side, uh, Inuit films specifically about difficult histories, not sunshine rainbow films, but about, about challenging things. And one side of the paper is full of uh, films by Inuit, and the other side of the paper is full of films not by Inuit. That is just the selection that we put together, like talking on Facebook for 20 minutes last night. It's a great primer. It's not exclusive. And I just want to say this uh, in particular because... Uh, Dominic has said in the media, why don't Inuit tell their own stories? Why aren't people doing this? And it, that is deeply uh, offensive and condescending to us because we've been doing it. We have, you know, the record is online and it goes back, you know, many, many decades. And, you know, that, that record is there. And so, it, and also, you know, it, it contradicts this idea that Inuit somehow uh, don't want to work with non-Inuit people to create films. That's not true at all. There's a whole vast body of great films uh, that are challenging, that are truthful, that are gritty, that do look at this history. So we'll have them, uh, we'll put them up by the door at the end of the second half for people to take away. But, pour revenir sur la question originale. Back to the question, if I can talk in my own personal name, I do think, I only hope that in the end, after having poisoned my life uh, uh, and after seeing the movie, it's that, you know, uh, this pushed to the limits of my knowledge and I found out more about this culture. So, the, when I, the way I perceive the film and I'm still wearing the limits of my ignorance and my privilege. But uh, I know that this movie is perceived like that. In Italy and in France, it's an attack against the Canadian government. It's inertia. And all of that. So I think I always perceived myself as being a friend of that cause, and I feel very uncomfortable right now, as I was saying, because I'm in the chair of the enemy, basically, but no, that's not right. It's just uh, something quite gauche. I'm willing to consider 
that I might be prejudiced, and I think that through this discourse, this discussion, we will go forward, and maybe this will be more productive for white people than native people. Uh, it must be very difficult for you guys, too, and I can understand this is not very motivating. But if I can talk for me, I can tell you that I'm, I'm learning a lot. I agree with that, absolutely, concerning everything. So it's true to look at consequences in other countries when you think about dissemination and distribution. So I absolutely agree with that. Not what? Not at all. No. Oh. Merci. <laughs> oh, I'm reassured. Thank you. Dealing with is a profound ignorance, not just here, but in our country. Like, there's no, there's no Inuit studies class that people are man, like uh, that people take in in public schools, uh, let alone indigenous classes. You know that. Uh, the only one I know of here is at Concordia, the Inuit studies class, and that only started up recently. Um, just before Go it goes into back and forth, because uh, I'm getting the signal to take a break. Mm -hmm. So unless it's very... Well, very maybe. direct to the okay. um, uh, what Matthew was saying. Um, I do appreciate the sentiment of wanting to help Inuit. I do appreciate that intention. Um, I, I'm not sure I believe that was Gagnon's intent, but I think uh, many people who watch the film feel pity and empathy for, for Inuit and um, wish that there's a way or hope for a way to improve our situation, and I do appreciate that intent. Um, however, <laughs> that, that good intention doesn't mean that the film's not damaging. We don't need pity. <laughs> we need to stop being oppressed. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's... We don't need to be saved. Yes, we don't need to be <laughs> saved. That's what nearly killed us to begin with. That's, uh, you know... Um, and um, the idea that, you know, I, I feel so terrible for you that you're all drunks and, and sexual, uh, sexually promiscuous people. Like, I'm, I'm really sorry for you. I'm sorry we did this to you. That's not helpful because we're not all drunks and we're not all sexually promiscuous. Um, feeling pity and empathy for us for the wrong reasons is not helpful. It just f further entrenches the stereotypes and makes our work harder. Which is not to say that there aren't films that do do this. You know, I think mm -hmm. we're talking specifically about the Gagnon film, and I, I understand what you're saying about having that kind of affective emotion and probably knowing a little bit about the relationship of the Canadian state to Indigenous peoples and, and reading it one way, but I think there is a really profound danger in... Uh, in that most people are not going to come at it this way and are not going to see it as a historical trajectory, but just something that's happening right now. I, I think the film wanted to uh, denounce a little bit, uh, in a way, Nanook of the North and might have been replicating it in a postmodern way, maybe. Um, that's a good note to, and we'll to yeah. stop the <laughs> We'll take a break. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, that's great. Postmodernism <laughs> and Nanook, uh, that's, you know, that's a perfect moment for us to... I'll take a five-minute stretch break, and then uh, after five minutes, we're going to reconvene and open it up to you folks in the audience for questions and comments. So five minutes. Okay. Um, here's how it's going to work. Is everyone listening? Please. Um, if we can speak slowly, we've already, um, uh, the interpreter's already almost passed out from exhaustion from the I first hour. I'm very sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I recognize that is my um, fault. <laughs> uh, but now she's had a little break, but she's interpreting both English and French. Um, yeah. yeah, it's amazing. Thank you. You can interpret that as gratitude. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we have a roaming microphone, and um, I would ask that uh, that you remind yourself of my opening statement about respect, um, and that includes we're trying to avoid really long monologues um, as well. So respect just in, it just isn't in the content of what we say, but it's in how much space we take up in the room. 
um, because there are several people, several voices, several perspectives, and we'd like to hear from as many people as possible, and we have a, not a lot of time. So that means I should stop talking and turn it over to you. So if you could put up your hand if you have a comment or a question um, for the panel, as a, the roundtable panelists as a whole group, or as uh, or to individuals, um, just be clear in that and try to be concise, please, and mindful and respectful. So we, there's someone down here and then up there. Hi, thanks for a very good organization of this, first of all. Um, but I want to make a comment actually about the film of the North going to Europe and European audiences um, interpreting it. Uh, I come from Europe, but also I was lucky enough to work on another film, uh, so which Alitia mentioned, um, which came out a year before of the North. And for those of you that don't know, it's um, it's a portrait of Saul, who is a young Inuk who uh, ends up dying in um, uh, questionable circumstances. And of course, it shows what a lot of young Inuit are dealing with in the North. Um, and the film is co-directed by an in uh, in your common and um, in uh, Quebecois. Uh, so we actually applied to a lot of the festivals that uh, of the North were shown in and the film wasn't uh, selected for the festivals. So it's a very interesting thing, uh, you know, a film that has a lot more complexity, I would say. Um, it's not manipulative. Uh, and the next year, you have Up the North going to the same places mm -hmm. and gaining awards. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up um, and also to think of, you know, the European audience is very interested in uh, First Nations and Inuit issues, but they don't have a larger context. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes when things are not as, um, when things are a bit easier maybe to swallow or or they're more manipulative or sensationalist I'm not sure but but you know they they are received differently and of course these are festivals that are, have very much the white male perspective as well so just wanted to bring that up and and it's not for artistic or political uh, lack of merit because Soul is yes. an amazing film by the way it's on the list and just won a <laughs> Canadian Screen Award for best documentary so okay so <laughs> well, it was a comment, not a question. Oh, is there a question? Yeah, but in case. I believe uh, Maya was pointing out that one, this one film has done, has circulated, while the other hasn't, and they come from, well, they're on, they're they're documenting at the same, supposedly the same place, mm -hmm. and if anyone wants to speak to that in terms of uh, the films circulating abroad. I can I, I can add to that a bit. I, I, I did meet with RVCQ uh, in January. Uh, they, you know, they they uh, spoke like they reached out to me and I met with them. I talked with them for, with them for almost two hours. You know, and they they said uh, one of the things they said that they can't pull the film due to censorship. And I asked them, well, how many film submissions do you get every year for your film festival? They said 500. How many films do you show uh, in your film festival? They said about 310, 315. So I said, there's almost 200 films that aren't shown in your film festival. How is the censorship when almost 200 other films are not shown? And I said, also, um, how about uh, you show another film as well uh, that could maybe be a counter argument to Of the North that maybe does provide some context. Uh, that film was uh, So That You Could Stand. That's the one I suggested because it was made this past year. Uh, it was produced by Makovic Corporation and Inuit corporation here in Quebec and it's a documentary that covers the history of the James Bay Northern Quebec agreement from an Inuit perspective and they told me oh actually we had that film submitted and I said oh so you're going to be showing it and they said no we're not showing it um, so I said how is this how is the censorship then if you're not going to show this film but you decide to show of the north well, you have to be careful. I program short movies for the Rendezvous and other festivals. And I have my own prerogative as a programmer. I have my own eyes, my own vision. So, you know, it's my selection. And sometimes 
uh, movies have a great career somewhere else and I decided not to show them myself and then I think oh shit you know that was I, I should have gotten that one and the other one wow what a great film and finally well nobody cares so it's very subjective very subjective appreciation so if you shout discrimination automatically and I don't know the film you're talking about I have not seen it but you know and to refuse a film for reasons that are of the festival that's different from selecting a film and then withdrawing the film because of pressure so with the rendezvous to show of the north that would have be, been much too expensive for the festival because i think many uh filmmakers would have withdrawn their films and to show of the north would have been bad for the other 300 films so that's why and that, that's what motivated their refusal and there's a difference between the two was the film refused basically or was it selected and then after getting pressure and after the campaign and the debate then they decided to withdraw it because you know they would see they saw that uh, there would be a problem so I can't speak for Madame's example here for other films uh, I mean it can be very, very unfair. I mean, you know, the life of a film and festival can be very unfair, and it is. A, a, a question is in response to that, then, is, is that uh, what is the diversity makeup of your uh, organization that's on the jury? Because I've sat on many, many juries before for arts councils and competitions and all kinds of things, and it's something that is... Uh, really important in some contexts, and I, I just don't know if it's, you know, maybe it's, it's like, is it... Uh, you mean for the programming, the film programming? Yeah. Who's oh, it's one person who does, <laughs> I, I do short film, right. another one does a uh, documentary, another one does fiction, and it's just one person selecting them. Because you have to watch so many films, right? Like it's yeah, also, and if you have a lot of people, you know, it's, 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 it's like a 120 hours of work, so, you know, you pay these people, so you have five of them, it's just more money, that's just like, there's a lots of imperatives that make up this decision. Of course we look at it through our, I look at it through my eyes, you know, that my visions of, my vision of cinema, what I like about it, and, and that's it, you know, and... If, uh, if, if I can interject, uh, Heather was, so Heather was asking about diversity, um, and... Cultural diversity. Yeah, the, 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 is there a diverse makeup of, of the ethnic cultural backgrounds of the programmers, because this can often impact Yes, the lenses you're talking about through yes, which sir, people yes, make selections. Yes, there's one person per category. So at the rendezvous, it's like that. For the Vision du Réel in Lyon, I don't know. Maybe they work differently. It depends. But of course there's an impact. Of course you're right. Yeah. And then there's someone at the back. Uh, Michel de Patsy, merci. Michel de Patsy, thank you for organizing this event. I'm a visual artist, and I'm also a uh, filmmaker, and I'm a friend of the Inu on the North Coast. I've been going there a few times a year for 25 years. I never done a film on them until very recently, because for me the most important thing was meeting with them. So I wasn't going up there to make a movie. It was a meet. It took 25 hours, uh, 25 years be before I actually decided to do a film. And I was able to see Of the North last December and to discuss it with many, many people from the milieu. So, you know, with other filmmakers, we debated the film. I won't tell you about the context to be brief, but it was a difficult context. And I took away one thing. Vision du Réel in Switzerland has compared this film, and you said it before, a response to Nanook of the North of the 21st century. And I agree with that comparison, basically. What surprised me a lot in the discussions was that to see us as a white society where we are now in our understanding of colonialism. We do not understand what it, I it is to be a colonialist. We say we're all very left-wing and especially with making movies and all of that. Uh, but uh, 
the Flaherty film a hundred years ago showed him dreaming of the Eskimos and Inuit. So today, Dominique Gagnon shows how he sees them too, because, you know, that's the very same thing with the stereotypes he has in his head. And when we were debating, oh, is Dominique Gagnon racist? No, but the object he created is a racist object. There it is. And then we have to just move on to another question. Yesterday, Videograph announced that version number six of, of the North is ready. The sixth version is 74 minutes of black without music. So we have to stop and creating and talking about censorship. He, Gagnon made a movie not thinking about he living in a society that oppressed these people. And we have to understand that. And that's why this debate is so interesting. Thank you. <laughs> so you don't, I know you get excited and passionate. You don't need to yell into it. You can talk very <laughs> quietly if you want, even. Okay, go ahead. Does anyone want to respond? Uh, just that I agree. I, I don't think that Dominic Gagnon is racist. I think that he was totally ignorant of a culture and, and so ignorant that he didn't realize uh, the implications of what he was doing. Well, I, w I would say that, you know, either he's not racist. You could, you could say that, but you could also say we all have a little racist in us. <laughs> Um, just yeah. in varying ways, we all have our own prejudices, and uh, he obviously has very strong pre prejudices about Inuit. Uh, I, I don't, I don't think that necessarily makes him a, a bad person. I think it makes him ignorant of Inuit and careless. Yeah, let, uh, let me let me pre rephrase because you're yeah. right. I don't think that it. I think that he did not have a malicious intent at the beginning against mm -hmm. Inuit. Uh, I think that he did make a racist object. Yes, and in the end the way he's chosen to react to the fact that he's hurt to Inuit, I think has been uh, antagonistic and uh, not malicious. I'm, I don't know what word I'm searching for, but I think you get what I mean. It hasn't been pleasant and it hasn't been helpful. And I think that says a lot about someone's character. Thank you. There's someone at the very back below the exit sign. So hold it away. <laughs> Hello, my name is Nadine Gomez and I'm a filmmaker. I will just, uh, I just have two little, well, positions on a debate that I think is very passionate and arouses many, many problematic issues. So basically, I find that what is lacking is a base for a discord or a base for rhetorics concerning, well, what we're saying about the movie and what goes beyond the movie, too. We're talking about a documentary. Do we have a clear definition of what is a documentary? I think that uh, there are many ways to interpret uh, documentaries. For me, it's art. For other people, it's an informative medium that should show reality, and I don't agree with that. But you see, already that proves there's a difficulty to talk about something like that. So we have the word art in the title of our conference here tonight. But what about the role of art? Art means, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of expression. That's another complex uh, reality. And there are many ways to talk about it in society. So I think that these are fundamental questions that are not addressed. Also, the role of uh, the artist in freedom and maybe he, uh, the way that he might be entitled to making mistakes. The artist maybe uh, is not always adequate because sometimes he will push where you're not supposed to push because he's an artist, he's not a politician. So do people talk about that? The object is might maybe not well perceived, but uh, I don't know about that. And also, the person that I'm given as a viewer. I saw the film and what I heard is that, um, you know, uh, I would have received this movie as a vision of pity on the Inuit. Well, that's false as far, false as, far as I'm concerned. No one asked me how I received the film. So I feel that I'm not quite being respected because, you know, because uh, you want to tell me that I saw something racist, but I didn't even have a chance to talk about it. 
So, you know, it's a kind of dialogue we should have and that we're maybe not having necessarily. Andrea Abib talked about that. The fact that you're watching the film, will it increase prejudice and stereotypes? Is it necessarily... He had a similar question. It's very, very pertinent and relevant. It's quite interesting. Thank you. Seeing documentary as art, um, that's true. I mean, like, film is very fluid, you know, like, you can use different terminology to mean different things. But when the filmmaker has gone on record saying that this is reality, I think mm. I didn't hear that, that was on CBC. Yeah, that was, uh, it, was, it was recorded. It was a video interview. It was the response um, at the very end. I uh, can't remember when it was exactly. Uh, Dominic Gagnon was wearing a white T-shirt. He had, <laughs> he had, um, he, he, did the re he did a response both in English and French, in the English version. At the very end, he said that this is reality. So like, you, when you have the filmmaker saying something like that, then, and he's also said before that he is approaching this as an ethnographer. Um, you know. He told uh, me the opposite, though. He told me that the, the, the people, the curators in the film festival described him as an ethnographer. But, um, he's uh, said many different things that oppose each other. Yeah, also. we just have to be careful because he's just not here to respond. So I think we have to yep. be careful not to make a trial out of the uh, questions. Sure, you know? um, but let's just also um, see if everyone wants to speak and mm -hmm. to each point. But is everyone good on this one or Alita you look like you wanted to yeah. say something um, just to the point about you know that that she this woman didn't have an opportunity to express her reaction to the film um, perhaps you didn't take it as uh, pity or, or empathy for Inuit but many many people have online expressed that this film made them feel pity and empathy for Inuit so you may not have reacted that way but many people have I okay. also think that at every every event we all have uh, a chance to to express ourselves. It's not, it, you know, once we leave this room, it, it's there's no rule saying that you cannot speak about this film ever again. <laughs> um, so I I, th I think I mean like this is an ongoing conversation. This has been a conversation that's been happening for months now. So I, I think we all have a chance to express ourselves and say something. Um, I, I certainly believe so. Uh, and that's why there's a mic floating around, and that you know people are given a chance to say something. Uh, yeah, okay. but I mean that's one of the things that I've heard ex as well. The argument that oh well you can't you can't comment about the film if you haven't seen it. Well then why are people saying that at the same time admitting that they don't know much about Inuit? How can you comment about film about being racist or not if you don't even know the people in, uh, who are the subject of the film? It's an excellent counterpoint, but we and and we have uh, someone in the middle, sitting next to Rodrigue. I don't have my glasses on. Okay. Uh, I'd like to answer something. For me, it's a fallacious argument to go from the position what is art, because what we're talking about is dominating art in a dominating dominant culture. And there's no real conversation if we don't start by thinking. And like what you were saying when you were talking about the fact that Inuit uh, film d doesn't have a place in festivals. French, but what I want to say, ce que je veux dire en fait, ça. What I'm trying to say is as a society, I wonder what this says about us to say, well, this is a movie that enables us to have a conversation. Why do we need a, m a film made by a white filmmaker who never went up to see these communities, who does not know their reality? Why do we need this m film in order to have a conversation and how could the conversation be positive when it is articulated in two poles? One pole pole where the people are saying it's offensive, not ethical, 
and it's a stereotype. And on the other hand, the other poll says, okay, but what about uh, freedom of expression? So I don't think it's a conversation that is really positive and really have a great outcome. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, I think it's using this film as, as, a, as a way to start a conversation. That, that's basically using this film, like trying to start a conversation by insulting the other party. You know, this is starting. This is starting a conversation in bad faith, I think. Um, and I and I, I don't think that anyone really wants to start a conversation like that. Okay, there's there's about three people down here at the front that had their hands up. Hello. Okay. Um, I think I also wanted to speak to the idea that films like these and um, sort of other events that are similar, uh, this sort of rhetoric that, well, at least this is generating quality conversations. Um, I think that's missing the point that the people who are directly affected and often traumatized by these things, um, they have to give a tremendous amount of emotional labor in order to have these conversations. And uh, it's it's sort of speaking to who's prioritizing, who, who are we pri prioritizing having a learning experience from these, uh, from these instances. Mm -hmm. um, bon, moi j'ai pas grand chose à dire. Well, I don't have anything to say right now because I haven't really, I, I'm extremely sad to see that this film is the flag for freedom of expression. It makes me feel like going out and hiding in the woods and never coming out. Because, you know, if I look at what's happening in Canada with the situation concerning, well, the native people, their life conditions, relations between cultures in Canada. And if you take an example with a film where everybody said, well, okay, he said this, he said that, it's not that great, if he wanted to do this, he wasn't able, da da da. Th and this is what we consider as our object for fighting. Well, I withdrew from the debate because I didn't feel like participating in that type of debate. And this was the object of that debate. And I am for freedom of expression, of course, so I would have to say, oh yes, this movie, this film, uh, but I don't know. I mean, I don't even know. It's not even object that, I mean, no one here will say it's a great, brilliant movie, incredible movie, love the movie, oh wow, love the movie, I'm so touched by the movie, there's stuff in there. No, it's not that at all. It's an innocent movie. It's a failure of a movie. Maybe I'm not being respectful. Uh oh, sorry. But anyway, it's not a great success. No one said it's a great, well done movie. So, if you want to defend freedom of expression, can we defend it differently and not use this as an example? This debate around the film and through an attempt done to stop its being distributed, just like censorship in general. I'm not saying that censorship applies here. We could talk about that. But it gives it a certain importance. Yes, it gives importance to a work which is maybe a failure, like you said. But ultimately, I think it turns against you because this debate generated by the film positions the film in history, in the history of cinema, and it's too bad if you, okay, if you think it's a failure, fine, and maybe we, we shouldn't give it that much importance then. Yes. I wanted to ask, is it possible for those of you who saw the film, because I didn't, to maybe read it 
another way like you know ethnographic and all of that and uh, and maybe think about his intention what I thought was interesting was the quote saying the best way to know if a people is oppressed is when the people duplicates what is done to him or to the, this people. I don't know much about the Intuit, but I'm from a visible minority myself. And when I realized that I was oppressed was when I acted unconsciously according to a certain stereotype and so, you know, it happened to me, and that's why I was very interested by this debate. And I saw a way of speaking about oppression and ignorance, and with Nanook of the North, with that stereotype, to talk about that tradition of colonialism and anthropologists, but who never actually went up there in person. So I wanted to ask, is it possible to see the movie and the debate around the movie and the controversy at another, at another level, to take it to another level? You mean a second uh, interpretation, another way of interpreting it? It's like what I said in the beginning. When they're pouring the wastewater, there are two ways to interpret that. So it can be like an optical illusion, depending on where your position, you see something or you see something else. And of course, you have your own experience, past history, subjectivity. For me, I understand very well uh, people who are, get angry at this film. And with reflection, uh, and with the work you did, I was able to see that position. Yes, another interpretation. I have been involved with this from the very beginning when it first screened at RIDM the first night. And it is thoroughly distressing um, to be at this point where a man who has had such a, a bizarre relationship with this film in terms of his own, his own position on what this film is, what his intentions were, um, who he is, he's told me himself, he's, he describes himself as an armchair anthropologist. Um, he, he's had, he's been, he was, he was intoxicated the second screening. It's really hard to know um, where he stands at any point with this film. He's, he's had such a varying um, take on it. And what I find really troubling is that that first screening, people are speaking to him and asking questions to the Q&A as he, if he, as if he was a kind of an expert, because he's a documentary filmmaker and there's no one else invited, and he's standing there and people are asking, them, asking him questions about a culture they don't know anything about, and he actually said, this is how they behave. And I, well, I was sitting there in the audience and it's like, we are in a very, this is a crisis situation when a man can be standing in front of 250 people at a sold out theater and speaking on behalf of another cultural group without ever having been there and have and all of this work that's been that's been going on trying to raise awareness about this film and it's still being shown all over the world this is like a crisis situation with a documentary genre this is this is a problem how someone can be this powerful with zero knowledge this is it's terrifying the film is so powerful and it, something something has to change film festivals have to be more critical they ha they can't just accept a film because it's Gagnon's latest film they have to they ha there has to be more of a a policy change around acceptance and take responsibility for presenting films in a public context and stand behind it can i oh sorry yeah right yeah I, if i could just respond um oh. Yeah, as far as I know, not a single Inuk even knew about this film until Jessie sent me a message saying sh that she just attended the screening and was horrified. And then I contacted Tanya Gillis um, and Kelly Fraser and asked if they knew that they were in the film, and they had no idea. 
um, so thank you, Jesse. <laughs> um, then Tanya and Kelly and I had a couple of days on Facebook privately um, messaging each other from three corners of the country, um, debating whether we should just let the film die a silent death, hopefully gradually over time, um, or whether to question it. And we were keenly aware that questioning the film and the validity of the film and his right to make this film would just bring it more attention. Um, and it was a really painful decision to make and I still don't know if it was the right choice because um, we have to be traumatized further in order to question it and we have to give the film more power by questioning it. So it's like lose-lose, no <coughs> matter which choice you make. You either let the racism perpetuate or you question it and give this horrible film more importance in, in the history of documentary filmmaking than it deserves. And, and I think you're right. It, it does have a place in documentary filmmaking uh, history in Canada now, and I hate that. Maybe we could give it less importance by questioning the limit, the technical material limits of the practice. I can't believe that by using a platform we cannot aspire to an absolute representation of a reality. And as I was saying, people who film themselves, I mean, how can you aspire to qualifying that real as real because it's a movie on people filming themselves or people filming people and then they put themselves online. So I think there's a material limit to that YouTube platform or those video platforms, whatever they are. And I don't think we can really call that perfect ethnographics because it's not that of a culture but it's that of a practice online. So I think there is a distinction there. The movie will never represent complete culture because the film has its own limits and constraints. And, and maybe this is not a glorious representation. I agree, I agree with that. But it shows other corporations and companies. So maybe that's why it's important to see the film till the end. Some people stopped at the middle. There are comments at the end that are done, that are offered uh, as a critique of the government, corporations, uh, etc. So there are uh, limits to the categories we used to understand it. The <coughs> images of the industrial development that happened in that film, none of it was in Canada. It was either in Alaska or uh, in the trailer, it was an offshore oil rig in the Baltic Sea. Um, the, the, the film is called Of the North, and it's like the Arctic Pole that brings, so it's, I wonder why it should have to be from Canada. Because uh, in many descriptions, and right now in the Napoli, uh, in the film festival in Napoli, Italy, in that description it says that this film is about a self-representation of the uh, descendants of Nanook. Nanook was a film that was made here in Quebec about Inuit. Do we have to be responsible? There's a social responsibility that is bigger if a film festival choose to define a film in a certain way. Maybe the artist did not give his consent. Is that, I've written many descriptions in the third Okay, okay, I'm going to I'm going to stop this and go to the next question. Sorry because we really can't go on these. Well, no, someone actually is holding the mic. I, I, and then I we'll hold the it. microphone. <laughs> I, I <laughs> um, yeah, like I actually also thought over the last couple of days about this whole idea of documentary and I actually saw the film twice and when I saw it the second time, I really looked at what what did he really do, and I really think that film can by no means pass as a documentary by what we know by now, 
And I think if that film could be shown anywhere, it's maybe at the Fantasia Film Festival. <laughs> so, I mean, that's where, that's where it would have its place. And, uh, uh, but I really think a main problem is that it's now perceived as a documentary. And, and I don't understand really how that happened. I'm wondering if Dominic submitted it to Documentary Film Festival, if it's Videograph who submitted it, or if festival solicited him pa on his, based on his past work. I'm really curious how that works, but really documentary film, everyone knows that this is always a subjective, a personal angle, but there's a base somewhere that you look at something uh, based on reality or you want to say something about reality, but this is really a pure fantasy and I think it's the only thing he said from the many different things Dominic Cagno said. At one point he also said the film is a fantasy, the point is to provoke, and I think he achieved the provocation, and I think it's a fantasy, but it's not a documentary. So I don't know if anyone knows how that worked. If someone from Videograph is here, if someone from RIDM is here, who could maybe answer that question, how did that film end up? Okay. Bonsoir. Uh, Good evening. I'm a programmer at RIDM. Uh, we've talked about about our IDM a lot uh, tonight. Uh, we have programmed the film in Montreal. I would like to mention many things concerning what has been said. So, first of all, back to the idea of the film description. I think that you have to be very careful with that, as you were mentioning. So, with the text in the film, uh, no festival texts are not approved by the filmmakers. That's very rarely the case. Maybe there are certain festivals where, yes, you'll have something submitted that is official for the catalog, but the normally, no, that's not the case. Now, concerning the film itself, related to this idea of, uh, well, what's the reality he's trying to show? Well, since the beginning, the film was a project that wanted to break and mix up all bar barriers, <coughs> frontiers of the North. So it's a mashup of things happening in Canada, Russia, everywhere. So if there's a synopsis that tells the opposite, that is wrong, because that's not the project. Then concerning the film itself. Even when you mention the fact, you know, the question, is it a documentary? That's a very broad question. Yes, it has been submitted to documentary festivals. What's a documentary? We could talk about that for a very long time. The film is a documentary because it is engaged with reality. Now, are we talking about a direct contact, immediate contact with people, with an interaction? So, you know, he would have been in the places where he filmed? No, of course not. Does he film a certain reality? Yes, I think he does film a certain reality. And this reality is extremely difficult to define because it is self-representation that you can find online the representation of other people too. So these videos were posted and you could debate that question. But first and foremost, the film is a cross between one vision, the filmmaker's vision, and his own preconceived ideas, and also a self-representation that he has accumulated. And of course, it's editorial. But the film, when we saw it, for instance, we considered it as, well, is it a provocative work? Yes, it is provocative, if you will, because it generated all this discussion, and especially because there's something violent in it, something that we could talk about. Because the idea of getting someone else's material and doing a montage with that, that is a process that is voluntarily special and taking low-qual images and putting those together, and that's how he works. 
that is in a way a, a way to provoke to trigger reactions that are violent so when we presented the film ultimately well there are many things first of all i don't add, uh, put not too much detail please i don't think there can be a safe context to present the movie i don't think so i don't think there could be a safe context for conversation around the film clearly there's a point of rupture a break-off point and for different reasons because I hear your point of view but it's not a point of view where we say well we'll sit down together and have a nice quiet conversation there is rage there is something that well, it, it means that it's a different definition of documentary. And we're talking about the filmmaker. Okay, please, sorry, sorry. We have many other hands. Thomas's question, it sounded like you were, an, that you, part of programming the film was you were anticipating this discussion. Is that correct? Okay. Okay. Um, who's next? Can I, can I we only have like time for a few more. Ten, oh, yes, ten yes, of course, point. of course. You need to stop referring to this film as a self-representation. Yes. Many of the people in the film were filmed against their consent, even by the original poster of the, the original person who filmed it. You need to stop referring to it that way. That's not what it is. And when you do that, you, you make it sound like the entire film is condoned by Inuit, that it is from our point of view, and that's not what it is. I, that's okay. what you said. So I also wanted to, to reply yeah. to a comment from earlier about how this film of the North is about the circumpolar world. If that's the case, then why aren't there Norwegians in the film? Why aren't there Russians in the film? Uh, yeah, the only yeah, but why do, why do we have an ideal of representation? This is what I'm wondering. Stefan, you want yeah, to continue? Sorry. The, sorry. The, the only people that you could visibly see their faces and st uh, were, uh, well, save for a few, a very few, I can only think of one or two, were Inuit. Mm -hmm. um, the people that were not Inuit, you couldn't see their faces. There were, there were two videos that uh, actually had the word Antarctica at the beginning of the title. You couldn't see their faces, you couldn't see their skin or anything. So, if, and another problem, and this is another thing that's problematic is though, is that this homogenizes Inuit, this homogenizes the North. There are actually many different types of Inuit in the world. There's Inuine, there's Inupiat, there's Inuvialuit, you know, um, my grandparents, like one is Haraktumut, one is uh, Karnumut, you know, uh, each one of us here, we come from different uh, parts of the world. Like the, the whole Inuit Nunangat, Inuit, Inuit territory is very vast and we do have differences within our own culture. And that's the problem when you say like, oh, this is supposed to represent the entire circumpolar world or, you know, represent Inuit. There, there's actually diversity amongst Inuit that you don't see here. And that's, and, that, and it's not just with this film, but generally with a lot of other uh, representations of Inuit, it, it, uh, we see this homogenization happening. And do you honestly think that people watch this and think it's not about Inuit? Like, I th I think it's pretty obvious. Most people walk away thinking <laughs> it's a film about Inuit. So to say it's about cir the circumpolar region in general, I think is dishonest. Especially when the title is based off of the nook of the north. I, I just don't understand why um, someone would make a representation that is supposed to be about you know, advocating for Inuit people. He said basically that, you know, trying to show the world this thing. And then when the Inuit say, this hurts us, this harms us, this affects our actual lives. Why someone would dig in and not be open to listening to that and not want uh, to change what they have, not want to be open to having a conversation about that. It is incredibly hurtful, it's real, it has a real impact on our lives. Um, okay, so we probably have time for a few more. What uh, I, I don't have my, what time is it now? It's, we're, it's 9:40. Okay, so <laughs> our, it's just our interpreter. Let's let's yeah, I know. Let's. Uh, I think there's one back there, and then we'll come down here. This if that's okay. Set her hand up for a long time. Where? <laughs> in, the, in the purple. She's at her purple. hand up a lot. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's that's where I just pointed. Okay. Mariel. <laughs> yeah. 
I can translate myself if the, <laughs> <laughs> if the interpreter leaves. Um, yeah, I, I, bon, je vais commencer en français quand même. I'll start in French. I think that the five last months, in the five last months, we all felt that uh, the conversation is not really on the film anymore. And I would like us to realize and to do a little exercise uh, to sort of shift the conversation on film to the conversation itself. Because there are a few aspects of this conversation that worry me. And certainly one of these, and it's a comment I have heard in the past five months, is that this is a conversation that has a frontier, a limit, a cultural frontier. Uh, you're you're being translated, so okay. there's... And that, in fact, the debate uh, amongst the whites, certainly, is, uh, is you know, the, the sort of um, Anglo PC point of view is on one side, and the French formalist side is on the other, and, and these two cultures are not communicating. So I, I, I think I just wanted to remind everyone, and it's really pathetic that uh, it happens sort of on the skins of the Inuit. But, but, I, but I would like us to focus on, on the conversation itself. I think it's fantastic that this debate is happening. I think it's very, um, it's like the angel of history is flying over us and it's great. Uh, but I think that we're mistaken to keep referring back to the film that was merely the catalyst of it all. Thank you. Okay, there was uh, this gentleman here in the middle, the white shirt. Thanks. Um, I know this is probably a, a weird ask, but if, if, if everybody on the panel could just give me like a very short response, because I'm interested in, in everyone's response. Um, I wrote it down so I could be as succinct as I could possibly be. <laughs> Assuming racist attitudes continue, would it be valuable to continue to have racist movies made and distributed as a bellwether of racism, or is the emotional labor and trauma that those products evoke, is that cost too high? Myself, I don't want to respond to that because I, I don't think I was ever a victim of racism, so I have no voice here. Go ahead. Over. Même chose pour moi. Same thing for me. It's important. Uh, like I, I actually was involved with a project right now called uh, Real Conversations About Race, and I was invited by CBC to come and talk about. And they're asking me questions like, you know, tell your story about how you've experienced bigotry or racism. And I'm going to a room full of people of color, people of, of different ethnicities. And I'd say, uh, where, where's a white person? Uh, why, why is it okay for, for why is it okay, like socially acceptable for me to talk about how I've been victimized? Um, but maybe it's, it doesn't seem it's okay or it's uncomfortable for uh, a white person to talk about, hey, like I've, I've noticed that I benefit from inequality. Um, so I, I, think, uh, I, I think important, like you know, this is an important conversation to have, uh, conversations about racism. I think there certainly is definitely a place in film, a place in, in uh, social discourse or public discourse about about this topic. Um, I don't think that this film was really a, a great way to start the conversation. I think there's a lot, uh, there's much better ways to to have this conversation. I I speak, I lecture in this classroom to a demographic that is pretty much like this demographic, you know, like four people of color and a couple of native people and then largely a non-native uh, non audience. And uh, so, it, it, you know, it is part of my job to have this conversation uh, on a regular basis around difficult issues like this. And I think my only response can be that there is 
massive reams of archival and visual and textual and film um, media that can talk about racism in ways that are constructive. We do have an education problem in Canada. We do have uh, all kinds of issues around awareness, but I don't think that we need to produce things that are deeply offensive to people who are colonized in order to have a conversation about this. Uh, ditto. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's an interesting idea. It, it would be, <laughs> I don't know what a fun project, but an interesting project to make really racist films um, to reflect Canada's ra racism back to itself. That's kind of a funny idea. Uh, the problem here is, though, that this film was not made with that intent and it was not received in that way. It wasn't um, presented as a racist film uh, reflecting racism back to Canadians. It was presented as this is what Inuit life and culture is like um, and this is how Inuit represent themselves on the internet. So that it doesn't work. This film doesn't work for that purpose. Um, but also, even if that was an interesting ex exercise to make really racist films to, um, as, you, as you said, as, as a, um, like a gauge for how racist our country is right now, I think you'd have to be very careful, um, particularly with people who are very marginalized and so rarely get heard on the national stage. I'm, I'm just wondering here, because this is the first question I wanted to ask in the first place about um, his intent. So I'm interested in hearing what you think his intent was at the end of the day, because sometimes you say you're not interested in knowing his intent, but sometimes you also um, punish his movie maybe for the intent. So I'm just wondering how I can situate myself in the intentional context. You know? I'm, I'm interested in his intent. Um, I, the only thing I can glean from is, is from news articles, from his interviews, uh, mm -hmm. and from the descriptions I've seen in film festivals. Um, I have, uh, through two other people who are in this room, uh, help, who helped me, uh, fill out an ATIP request, access to information policy request, with the Quebec Arts Council to see uh, what the description of the film was in the grant proposal. Uh, those two times the Quebec Arts Council denied uh, that request. Um, so, and I thought that was probably be the best way to find out what uh, Gagnon's description of the film was or his explanation of the film because ever since then the, the explanation has changed. Um, I, but I am still interested in finding out about the intent of the film. And all I can really go by right now is just the news articles as I said before in the interviews. Yeah, I already said that I, I don't think that he made this film with a malicious intent. I think he actually did have an idea around, as you were saying, around mm -hmm. like development and what's that doing to the North. And without doing any research, he made a correlation uh, between two sets of images that he saw and then went out and tried to uh, make a bot an artwork mm -hmm. based on what he thought was happening. And I think that is where the, the danger of the project lies, is because he made a false uh, correlation between causation and and impact, and so that is what the Inuit community is, is so upset about, right? Uh, I forget what the question was. <laughs> was it about him? What do you think what, what do I think? So yeah, so I, uh, I mean, I don't actually think he had a malicious intent. I think he, um, I think he had an idea about what it was and decided to uh, go and look for the images that would fit his narrative. If you, I, I invite you all to go home and Google Inuit on, or YouTube Inuit, and see how far you have to get before you see these kinds of images. It's not, it's Hard not something time. that I believe that he just went online and was like, hey, this is all Inuit self-representation. Yes, I, mean, yeah. I think yeah. it was, you know, he was looking for, you know, drunk Inuit, uh, but the abusing the animal Inuit, you know? But I'm just wondering, is it the job of the artist to make sure that what he shows in the movie is not the first thing you get on Google? You know, I'm just one, you know, because then what is, what is his approach? What is he contributing? I shouldn't be speaking English. I hate it. So maybe we have time for one last question or no? I think we should release the interpreter. We should re <laughs> the interpreter is released. Okay. Thank, um, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you. Um, and uh, we shall all be released soon as well, but uh, maybe there's time for one or two qu more questions or comments if the first one is uh, succinct. And also please...
try to maybe contribute something that hasn't been brought up or said so that we can leave on that. Yep, back there. Sorry, I'm not. Emmanuel? Right there, yep. Um, okay, so we're working without an interpreter, so I'll try and go back and forth. Um, I was very interested in uh, what Heather said uh, at the outset around um, the experience of museums from uh, a couple decades ago and uh, the development of uh, clear codes of ethics. Um, I, I think that it's difficult to apply that experience to the filmmaking community because, um, you know, filmmakers have individual agency. It's not it's not really a top down um, environment. When you get into the festivals, it's a it's a very different picture. But I'm trying to think about how to um, how to how to derive some lessons from this experience and and how to. Uh, you know, build something in the way of of best practices and and just ways to to help folks out that that want to listen uh, to how do we do a better job um, with respect to things like self representation, with respect to um, respecting community standards, recognizing of course that no two communities are the same. Um, and that community standards are complex and contested. Um, I'm trying to think basically, you know, in, in the spirit of uh, giving less importance to the film and, and more to um, the, the, general, uh, the general situation. Like, how, how do we move forward from this and how do we create um, some better practices in our communities? And, and that applies to filmmakers and it applies, I think, also to festivals. I think actually mu the museum uh, example is a really great example. Uh, you say that filmmakers have their own agency. Uh, curators in museums have their own agency. Curators put together and they plan e exhibits and each exhibit tells a story, just the same way each film tells a story. So I, I think, you know, I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from the museum industry or the muse you know, museum organizations these institutions, because at, at the end of the day, both films and exhibits, they're there to tell a story. I've worked both in film, I've, I've spent eight months working in a museum, and I see a lot of connections that could be made. So I, I think, um, yeah, that's, that's basically what I think is, uh, looking at uh, the International Council of Museums uh, Code of Ethics, uh, uh, Article 6.5 and 6.7 uh, could easily be adapted uh, to the film industry, and that's just basically saying if, if you're if you're going to be telling a story about a culture, uh, a group of people, that they're involved, and that they have their own agency as well, because I, I think uh, yeah I don't want to go back into the film, but uh, yeah I mean it, and I think that uh, that's a great question, thank you, and I think that if we look at uh, what happens in the visual arts world, for example, we they already have a kind of a system for this, and that is. You know, if you want to access public funding, then there is a jury of peers. And so when you're talking about, you know, that there, and it does cost a little bit more. <laughs> it is, you know, it is more of a hassle. It takes more time and you have to pay people to review things. But it, it builds into considerations. And that way, if something, uh, if something does go through that people disapprove of, they say, okay, but I, I'm, I wasn't, you know, I, this was vetted through a process before, you know, $30,000 in public funding was distributed to someone to make a work of art. Martha, did you have a, is there a? Well, we should hear from new people, I think, because there's so many people who want to sp speak. Martha's new. <laughs> uh, so there's someone, r there's someone right here. <coughs> and, then, no? and then if there's, and then we can go back to you. Uh, if, uh, I am not the people who are talking, but I mean, one well, thing no. that, uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, is it there or it's over here? I okay, the, mic, but, uh, it's, the problem is no one will hear you at the back. Okay, okay. coming. No, but then I promise we're, we'll go to you, sorry. It's getting unruly and I'm getting tired, so. No, uh, I just want to say something that uh, struck me, you know, when I heard about the film and uh, everything that uh, people were, was, you know, saying about the film. C'était le fait que 
tout à coup, on aurait dit que les gens qui se posaient des questions sur les réactions des Inuits au film ont réalisé qu'il y avait une audience Inuit. Like, nobody has thought before that the Inuit were actually an audience as much as anybody else. And wow, they're actually watching the film that we're making with their images in there. Oh, okay. Like that, that was a big surprise. How embarrassing <laughs> it was, you know? There's one? Okay, because yeah, I think kind of in the, the denim jacket right there. Okay. Uh, who, we'll make it quick. <laughs> yeah, you're the right there. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I think that although the, the, the pretext for this evening may not um, may not please people. I think that there are some aspects of social good that come out of this kind of discussion. That's an opinion. But um, I, I guess I become a little bit um, alarmed um, when people begin to say, well, you know, what we really need to do here is find out precisely what this guy told the agencies that he was going to do as a filmmaker. I, I mean, I think we've got to be very careful about engaging in the kind of witch hunts which at the end of the day, um, the results may not please us as a cultural community. Likewise, putting a great vote of confidence into our museums. I, I think we need to be questioning all down the line, but I have huge uh, anxiety issues, doubt I will sleep tonight at the idea that uh, we're going to start penetrating artist statements and filmmaker statements because they've gone to seek public money. Many filmmakers, many artists have started out to do a certain project and done something else. That, that's, that's very true. We've actually had that conversation that I said yeah. that, you know, we don't know what the content of the application is, a, you know, a, a grant application. I think we're not beholden to anything you write in We a need to judge what has happened with the film and the response in this room, some of which has been extremely enlightening, and I thank you for that, but I am asking you not to put in that application. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think, um, for one thing, like, I'm, I'm not praising museums as like the, you know, <laughs> like the end all be all or anything like that. No, I mean, like there's certainly problems in the museum uh, organizations as well, and these institutions as well. I'm just saying, though, that they've had this conversation of representation for decades. And I think, personally, I think that they've come to a solution that I think that is something that the film industry, the film community can look at. And they can say, how can we adapt their solution that c to fit our problem or our situation? So I, I, I never said that, you know, uh, the museum organizations are, are the angel that's going to save us from what's happening here. Um, I also would like to say, I mean, like, some people have said that, you know, uh, maybe this conversation or, or right now this event, uh, maybe some people have had uh, high emotions or whatnot. I, I think, though, that this has been a really good conversation. This has been a really good event. Um, I have no ill will towards a lot of people. I know a lot of us may disagree on certain details though, but I think a lot of us, I mean, we're all having a calm, you know, respectful conversation. So that's what, that's what I mainly wanted to say as well. Are we? I'm going to turn this mic off. <laughs> You're turn the microphone off? Okay. I, I just, before everybody, no panic at the disco, uh, or just one, I just want to say one quick thing as the moderator putting a punctuation on this maybe, and that's that uh, in Canada we do have limitations on artistic expression, and they're, they're legislated in our hate speech uh, in the two acts, the Criminal Code of Canada, and in the Human Rights Act. And that, th for better or for worse, those acts are delineating harm reduction. And what I see in this conversation around this film and around the denigration of a, a historically oppressed group of people in Canada is an effort at harm reduction. And I think it's an important conversation that we shouldn't get caught up in um, the, the, the wormhole of censorship when, but, but rather we should listen to the group who is feeling harmed, who has traditionally, historically been oppressed and harmed, and that 
it sounds like what we need is a lot of education. We need to diversify our, our cultural institutions and the people making selective decisions about the artworks that circulate in this country and the world. But that, that education and that elucidation, that burden should not just fall on the, uh, excuse me, on the indigenous people. It should fall on all of us because indigenous people, like those that are here today, Stefan, Heather, and Alethea, they're exhausted. Right, and talking about reliving the trauma and just going through this and, and not sleeping, it's exhausting. So I, I thank them very much uh, for all the work they've done around this film, and I'd like to also thank Mathieu and Mme Pierre for, for coming out because uh, f around 40 people were asked and they all declined, and they are people who have been very vociferously um, in favor of the film who declined to come and speak because I think they were worried that it would be a witch hunt and it would be you know, um, an awful experience. And so I, I thank you both for coming as well. And it, this hasn't been about pro-anti um, of the North. This is a larger discussion. And I thank you all for coming, and especially Fofa Gallery for organizing it, and especially these folks up here. Thank you very much. Can I, can I add? Can I add? Sorry. Alethea wants to say something, sir. Yeah. I just wanted to add... Um, uh, I think there are many people in this room who didn't like this film and many people who feel um, it's been unfairly or harshly criticized. Um, but one thing we all have in common is that we were all willing to come and talk and listen. Um, and it's, it's difficult as Inuit to have our voice heard, so I just wanted to express gratitude for everyone who showed up, including Matthew and Marie. Um, and Thank you for the invitation. Yes, um, and I also wanted to just point out that um, Isabella is also in the audience, and she's also done a lot of work in um, educating people on this issue. And she didn't speak today, but she's there, and she's been she working tried. hard as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for coming and listening. Nakumi. I think in private we can have a better one too.